Guy had uh, uh, enlisted in the University of New South Wales Regiment, was commissioned, uh, had postings uh, to Antwa, 17 Royal RNSWR, 4 and RNSWR, and 4 3 RNSWR, as well as postings of Brigade Division Military District Command level before commanding, commanding officer of the University of New South Wales Regiment. Uh, he, in, uh, in, uh, not, he's also a co-author of Ken Mackay, another member of the Institute, uh, in, in the, uh, writing a book, A History of the University of New South Wales. In civilian life, he taught English and history in New South Wales government schools before retiring as deputy principal, and is currently chairman of the New South Wales Committee of the National Ball War Memorial Association. And in my humble view, that memorial in Anzac Parade is the most magnificent of any of the memorials that we currently have in Anzac Parade. So without further ado, I'll ask, uh, I'll ask uh, David Deasy to do his presentation on post-war operations in the Middle East, and that will be followed by afternoon tea. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Us infantry guys like to think we taught Paul all about tactics and then he proceeded to become a division commander whilst we sort of stagnated uh, in the backwaters. But however, I think there's probably more to that story. Look, this is a, I think, a very interesting topic. It's very detailed. I can only just really hit the heads of bits and pieces as we go through in half an hour. Uh, it is, I think, a truism that most books will stop from the moment the armistice is signed. And for the armistice in the Middle East, it's not the 11th of November, it's the 30th of October, uh, when the Turks finally realised that they had a choice. They could uh, ask for an armistice, or they could find Australian light horsemen in the back streets of Ankara. And uh, I don't uh, say that particularly lightly. Uh, the Australians, and uh, we, we're going to talk a bit about Mustafa Kemal during this talk. Uh, he was not just associated with the Australians at Gallipoli, they had chased him all through Palestine and up virtually up to the Turkish border. So he was well aware of who Australia was, and we will, there's a, an issue that I'd like to raise with you afterwards. So what have we got at the end here? Well, first of all, we might have a look, look at the uh, actual topic areas. This, by the way, is about 30% of Chevelle's light armour that he had available to him at the end of the campaign. And this was a critical part of his final push uh, past the on the Alexandria. The five key things I want to talk or touch on this afternoon. The armistice and the problems of thereafter. The Lickley and War Graves. The Egyptian Revolt of 1919, the Kurdistan issue of 1919, and finally the Shah crisis of 1922. All have lessons for us today, and to a great extent, I'd suggest you'll start to hear some familiar echoes when I talk about some of the issues. Nothing much has changed in a hundred years. And I've got some slides to show. At the end of the war, the Desert Mounted Corps, which had spearheaded the British advance from the Suez Canal, was headquartered in Damascus. The 4th Indian Cavalry Division, along with the arm we saw, was heading north on the northern side of the Aleppo towards Alexandretta, pushing Kemal's 7th Turkish Army in front of it. The 5th, sorry, the Australian Mounted Division was halfway from Damascus to Aleppo to assist the 4th Indian Cavalry Division. That's when the armistice occurs. We see here Chevelle and his staff on the steps of their headquarters in Damascus in 1918. That's where most books leave the story. Problem is, it's not where Chevelle leaves the story, it's not where Australia leaves the story. Let's have a look at Armistice and its problems. This is the situation of the Armistice as it was signed. Now, 
Chevelle not only had to look after Syria as uh, head of the British administration, that was his baby, uh, one of the other four commanders got Egypt, and uh, I think Chetway got Israel or Palestine to look after. You can see there that already people are putting their bids in for control of Turkey. What Chevelle had to look after in, until some form of administration was decided upon was an area of southern Turkey, and this is something we often don't understand. But it stretches from Adana here all the way across, really, to the top of the Iraq border. So that entire area in there, in southern Turkey, is Chevelle's responsibility. He has to make sure that the Turkish armies are pulling back beyond that line that I've just drawn. It's not just a question of chasing them to the Turkish border. It was a question of actually pushing them well back towards Ankara. And, of course, everyone wants to go home. Now, you can understand that the Turks are not very impressed with just looking at that. We'll look a bit later at what the actual peace treaty meant and why we suddenly end up with the Shah crisis in 1922. So Chevelle actually <laughs> has to look after the legal side of the house, the policing side of the house, in that whole area. One of his key units in doing that is the Australian Light Car Patrol. Works wonders even with horse-mounted bandits, as they found, because they could arrive at 60 or 70 kilometres an hour. A Lewis gun is a nice equaliser when the other side only had rifles, and generally speaking, this mob kept the roads open, or the major roads open, and the Kurdish bandits out of business. But that's a fairly minor task compared to what else is going on. The Turks, in fact, decided they were not going to abide by the armistice. When I say Turks, we are already seeing a split in the Turkish ranks. There is a government in Constantinople, what we call now Istanbul. The Sultan is the democratic, of, I'll say democratic, that's the, the um, is the constitutional might, and the old style politicians are there calling the shots. But Kemal and his ex army officers or army officers are based in Ankara, and they are not happy with the terms of the armistice. And if you just had a quick look at the map I showed, you can see why. It's pretty well inhuman. And the terms of the Treaty of Service in 1920 is far worse. Uh, Turkey ceases to exist as a nation as we would know it under the, the treaty. And so he's rather dragging his feet on evacuating Turkish territory. Remembering, of course, from the Turkish point of view, all of Syria, all of Iraq, and eastwards, right into places like, uh, as far as the Persian border, is Turkish territory. And even today, I would suggest, if you look very carefully at the current Turkish government, they still regard those sort of areas as areas in which they have a very defined interest. Eventually, Chevelle had to, in fact, suggest that he would uh, start the offensive again. It's really pure uh, bluff because he doesn't actually have the entitlement to do so, but he certainly had the encouragement from Allenby to actually put the pressure on. And Allenby moved him from Damascus to Aleppo with a cavalry division with the embryo of an infantry division so he could chase or imply that he was about to invade Turkey. Now this is all happening in the period from November through to uh, April of 1919. November 1918, April of 1919. But in the meantime, let's very quickly move on and look at the Lipley and the Wargraves Commission. One of the, I think uh, Professor Garton pointed out the the really the emotional issue surrounding the term Anzac. 
Imagine then how much emotion is in Australian minds in 1918 about the Gallipoli Peninsula. And one of the first things Chevelle did in November of 1918 was send the two mounted regiments to occupy the Gallipoli Peninsula, the 7th Australian Light Horse and the New Zealand's Canterbury Mounted Rifles were sent across to occupy the peninsula. Uh, it was apparently uh, something that the rest of the Light Horse and the rest of the New Zealanders were not entirely happy with because everyone wanted to go. It was somehow restoring what they felt should have happened in 1915. And their job, essentially, was to begin the process of finding all the graves, and that was fairly difficult, because even though the Australians had, under uh, all the decks of the chaplain, had mapped a lot of the cemeteries, there was no actual survey data on his maps to actually place the cemetery. So you actually had to find the first couple of graves before you could then, using the map, now, they were important, the maps were critical, but what someone forgot was that all the personal data was actually on the wooden crosses. And the local Turks had used the wooden crosses for firewood. Uh, and the Turkish government discovering that thought that they would improve it, and they built false burial mounds to make it look very nice for the cemeteries there, but they bore no resemblance to what was on the ground. So, this gentleman found himself with a lot of trouble. This is uh, Lieutenant Cyril Hughes, uh, former engineer and uh, surveyor from Tasmania, and a member of the first Australian Light Force Engineer Field Squadron. He and several of his uh, selected people were sent to Gallipoli to map the cemeteries. That was their first role. And a little photo here, you can see them the sort of problems that they had to actually locate where the cemeteries were. And they actually did a full-scale survey from Chatham's post to Hill 60, a proper, because he had actually trained surveyors with him. Now, I just want you to think about that just for a moment. Here we are in enemy country, in, country, and we, in peacetime, and we have a foreign military force albeit only half a dozen people, actually mapping the terrain for us, not for them, for us. Right? Okay, terrible problems in sorting it out, and of course, in, by February 1919, our old friend Charles Boone is back on the weekly, with his own team, uh, Hubert Wilkins, uh, his uh, George Lambert, the artist, a couple of guys had actually been ashore on day one of Gallipoli so that they could actually also do surveys and work out <coughs> why this battalion failed to take this approach, etc. Okay, so uh, this is, if you like, the noble work as far as the Anzacs are concerned. This is the work which must be done. The two light horse regiments are on by February 1919 when it is clear that the Turks are not going to interfere with the process, and it's also at that stage moved that the Greeks are going to take over and run <coughs> the peninsula uh, forevermore that will become Greek territory. Um, so, and that's obviously got some pairs on it, if you can uh, see that. The Cyril Hughes and his uh, team remain there, and we will pick them up again when we finish this story, because the story of Gallipoli is not yet quite finished. Let's move on. And we need to talk about the next drama, the Egyptian Revolt of 1919. Now we heard Professor Garden tell us about the problems of demobilisation. Uh, and we know, of course, that there were problems with the light horse demobilisation particularly that their relationship with the local population, whether it be the Egyptians or whether it be the Palestinians, was not in fact one of brotherly love. Uh, I grew up with a relative who was a white horseman. He had no problems with the fact that they shot a few of the locals. As far as he was concerned, that was perfectly okay. I don't think he would have survived much in the political career times today. I think it was also why my parents never allowed him to visit him all that much because he used to say 
basic things. Some of the words I didn't understand and that's such. <laughs> um, okay, so let's have a look at, what, at what's going to occur here. Now, Australia actually has had a big hand in the First World War in stopping Egyptian revolts. In 1914, it was the Australian First Division, which was quartered in Cairo, which convinced the nationalists that it wasn't a good idea to start. You couldn't trust what the Australians might do. Uh, in 1916, Harry Chevelle's Anzac Mountain Division saw the Turks off, and the nationalists were supposedly waiting to see whether or not the Turkish force could get to the canal. The Australians stopped them from getting to the canal. Another chance gone missing. Now in 1919, three things come together. They probably picked the wrong time, but no, that's one of those things that happens in history. Number one, very few British troops on the streets. Why? Because they've all gone home, or they're off elsewhere. Number two, there are rumours spread by Turkish agents that Britain actually has lost the war. Now, the Egyptian educated classes and the nationalists know that's not true, but there's no harm in letting the local population think that. Look around you, where are the British troops? They've been beaten, they've gone home. Where are the Australians? Yes, and we know that there's been a little thing called the Battle of the Wazza, but all these nasty Australians have gone home, or are going home, they're out of the picture. Uh, it ignores the fact, of course, there were still four light horse brigades in Egypt. But um, you know, maybe they just can't be choosing if you're going to pick a time for a revolt. After all, the Australians have been disarmed and dis un unhorsed. It seemed a fairly safe bet. The final thing, the fairly important thing, is that what the Egyptians wanted was access to the Paris Peace Conference. Okay, because it was there, they read President Wilson's declaration, it was there that they were going to get their justice. The British protectorate in 1914 was fine because that pushed the Turks out of the way. <coughs> but it's amazing how much Turkish influence you keep finally floating back in. But now they needed to get to the peace conference and Britain basically said, you're a protected country, you're not coming to the peace conference. End of discussion. And so there was a invitation. So Britain, no, from London. It's always good when the Home Office actually <coughs> sort of tells you how to run things uh, said, well, block them up. So they did. They blocked up the national leadership, sent them off to Malta, and then the whole situation exploded. The other thing to bear in mind is that one and a half million uh, male Egyptians served Britain during the war as part of the Egyptian labor force. Thank you. 
General Brackle Priory, uh, but he's mainly the administrative head. The local commander is uh, British General Philip Palin from the 75th Division, and the Light Horse Field Commander is Brigadier General Lachlan Wilson from Queensland. Wilson and his staff, Wilson on the left. Philip, the same looking chap. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, well, he's uh, fairly young. Um, and uh, obviously knew what he was doing. <coughs> now, basically, Wilson actually has with him, along with Barnard Cars and Transport, he has seven light horse regiments, and they are based in at, I can find it. That's Zig. You can see the centre of this spider of uh, train lines. There's <coughs> a, a, a couple of battalions at Canard, or regiments up at Darwin Hur. And we have the Light Horse Regiment in Cairo. Um, Cairo, I'm told that the, the modus operandi was to approach a group of demonstrators and say, uh, you have 15 minutes to disperse, we will be back in 15 minutes. If you're still here, we will shoot you. Uh, they only had to do it once, apparently. <laughs> As I said, this is not something that we would regard today as politically correct. If you're looking for political correctness, none of the stories this afternoon about the Middle East are going to fit into that sort of time frame. Uh, small uh, place of Minot El Carmel, which we'll talk about in a moment. Okay, so Wilson is in fact uh, given, in fact, a justice of the Egyptian High Court Supreme Court as his chief political advisor. Uh, he's also given a member of a senior member of the finance department. Uh, obviously, don't spend too much money on this. Uh, and the other thing he is told is the rules of engagement. Uh, and that is, you will not shoot at mobs of Egyptians unless your life is threatened under any circumstances. Uh, one like old white horseman told him, we could never find this bloke called Mob, so it didn't really worry us. <laughs> um, it's a fairly loose set of rules of engagement. Uh, it, I mean, who's going to decide? what is life-threatening. One of the, you know, just to give you an example of this uh, Minat El Khan business, a troop post there from Lieutenant McGregor of the 10th Light Horse uh, was charged by a thousand riders at about seven metres out. I think that was probably uh, good fire discipline. The order to fire was given. In addition, a British aircraft and support fired two short bursts from its machine guns into the crowd. 39 Egyptians were killed, 25 wounded, and the rioters, the report said, were successfully driven off. Another 40 were drowned in their panic trying to get across the local canal. On another occasion, the White Horse had patrolled through along a railway line, and behind them they sent, just uh, perhaps someone was suspicious, they sent one of these rail trolleys with the biggest machine gun mounted on it, and they had to keep lifting it up over the road and track. And they came up on a station where there were about two or 3,000 people busily wrecking the station and burning it. And so the patrol commander noted the patrol, uh, I gave the instructions, and we ran three belts through the Vickers gun. Uh, it inflicted some 50 casualties, and the mob dispersed. Um, but the police would like to be able to do that at Friday night in George Street. <laughs> so then they decided that the Australians were getting a bit too enthusiastic and they insisted that every 11th round in the Vickers Belt and every 11th round in the magazine of the Lewis gun uh, was removed so that if you could, were going to continue firing, it was a con conscious act. You couldn't say that all the gun ran away or, or so on. But I would have thought most of the stories at that stage indicated that there was no quite serious intent. Continually tightened, so the, the, the story I, I really like here um, is the, um, the one where 
Uh, Major James Lloyd, CO of the 11th Light Horse Regiment at the time, um, was sent with a troop to deal with a mob at ransacking a school. Under no circumstances are you to use the bayonets or to shoot. So it's really quite rules of engagement now. The troop dismounted and went to work with rifle butts. A few minutes of rough housing saw the rioters off. Which is interesting, except when you know that James Loins, at 59, was probably the oldest squadron commander in the AIF, had 30 years of reserve experience behind him, and two tours of duty in war war, not to mention <coughs> now four years in Palestine, plus uh, wounded at the Italy. So we looked after trains, we probably drove them from what I can see, because uh, there were strikes, this is James Loins. Uh, still looking fairly tough, a uh, veteran at 59. <coughs> we then need to have a quick look at Kurdistan in 1919. I've got a great deal of time, but Australia's going to be quite a cut. Australia's commitment to Kurdistan is quite simple. Uh, the there had been a signal, in fact, two signal squadrons in Iraq. They were absolutely essential because Iraq was run by the Indian Army. They did not have technical equipment for wireless signal. After the war, we wanted to come home. Britain said, can you loan us the, something to keep the thing going until we can get troops out from Europe? And so we did. It's interesting, isn't it? That there's no actual agreement between the Australian government other than the verbal one year, right, hang on to whatever you need. And we keep a troop of two officers and 52 and 50 other ranks. Um, the troop Australian wireless signal squadron. Have a look at the terrain they're going to operate in in Kurdistan. Uh, not exactly sort of easy stuff to operate in. Just as an aside this, this is an Australian, but he's actually serving in the Royal Air Force. Uh, Eddie Robertson Manning was a uni student in England when the war broke out, joined the Royal Air Force, was offered a Royal Air Force full-time commission after the war, awarded a distinguished service order for evacuating the district resident from Suleimania uh, in Kurdistan. So a quick look at some of the signals equipment. Um, put land rovers there rather than uh, team on the forwards. It doesn't look much different than today. So we're looking here at the Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, now of course Britain can never go into any campaign without making a few blunders and a real mess of it to start with before someone puts the whole thing back on track. And it's no different here. Uh, in an attempt to relieve Suleimania, a uh, British commanding officer with four armoured cars, with about 20 T Model 4s, managed to lose the lot in one afternoon. Uh, but the signals were well received. This is uh, a comment made by a private in the 1st 4th Battalion of the Hampshire Regiment. Some time passed, then we saw some horsemen approaching. When they came up, they were seen to be Anzacs, and their limbers carried a wireless set. Hardy and resolute, they looked as they rode in. Where they had come from, or the circumstances of their appearance, right up here in the Persian hills, is obscure. Uh, they were such essential parts to making the British success against the Kurdish rebels that uh, at the end of the time there was uh, an Australian sergeant from Sydney, uh, Sergeant a uh, Alfred Thomas Rod, who was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal for conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty during the attack on Suwara Ratika on the 14th of August 1919, note the date there, under very heavy fire, particularly directed towards his wireless mast and equipment, he personally kept open wireless communications without a break and thus made possible the early arrival of aeroplanes 
which are largely instrumental in restoring the situation. Uh, at the end of the, the, the campaign in October, when they all came home, the 52 uh, force had received one Distinguished Combat Medal, three British Meritorious Service Medals, and two MIDs, which is a bad effort for a, a small unit. Let me just skip quickly to talk about, I might just add just one thing, a couple of things here. <coughs> Oh, by the way, uh, same area today, almost identical, Turkish bombs falling on Kurdish rivers. Um, not much has changed. The force received this British General Service Medal, Kurdistan and Flaps. What are we getting in Egypt? Well, Egypt didn't happen. Politically, it never happened. So, of course, there is no medal, no class, no decorations given to people like Wilson who you know, did a pretty fantastic job. What? But we were still getting recruits into both theatres. And in Egypt, it was, they were made eligible for the British War Medal, 1916, 1918, even though they were serving in 1919. It's <coughs> a way of getting around the problem of not admitting that you actually had a problem in the first place. The Shah Crisis. So we move forward to 1922 very quickly. Now this is what Turkey was. They, they, the plain yellow spot is what Turkey would have looked like. And the staff of Kamal wasn't having a bar of it. And so he began his own campaign. And by the time that uh, September comes in 1922, there is a problem. Like the British troops in Istanbul are about to be attacked. And what are we going to do about it? And I think this has got... There are important things which come out of it for us. The British Prime Minister wrote to the Australian Government on the, the 22nd of September, I should be glad to know whether the Government of the Commonwealth of Australia wish to associate themselves with the action we are taking and whether they would desire to be represented by a contingent. Now, uh, Colin talked about the, uh, the if you like, our change and, and our growth in foreign policy. Here we actually have a Dominion being asked, would you like to contribute? Now the Canadians and the South Africans said, not a, nothing to do with us, we're not having fire. Right. New Zealanders said, yes, 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 we'll go. Billy Hughes said, if it's a good cause, we'll give it our all. If it's a bad cause, we'll not venture a single man. And in between that, he basically had five pages of the sort of thing that Donald Trump tweets every, uh, every day and annoys people, uh, where he basically said to them, look, no, why come to us now? You could, should have kept us in the loop if you want to no, this why, why the urgency now? And in fact, he then went on to say later on um, that he got more intelligence and more correspondence from the British government in the next three months than he had in the preceding three years. Uh, it's really quite invective stuff from the root of England's years would have been burning red by the time he had finished reading it. So what would we do? What are we going to do? And that's the question I asked myself, hey, what could we do here? It's interesting, isn't it? Well, immediately they stopped the destoring and the decommissioning of the battle cruise from Australia. Uh, there is a committee met in Sydney consisting of the Defence Minister, the Assistant Defence Minister, who happened to be Major General Sir Granville Rari, and the Inspector General of the Australian Military Forces, Lieutenant General Sir Harry Chabelle. And what they agreed to was that we would send a division. If we were asked, we would send a division. The government only wanted to send a brigade because a division cost too much. Chabelle insisted that it had to be a division because if you send a brigade, the Brits will spray it up and send it everywhere and you won't have any control over what's going on. So we've established something called control as a result of our First World War involvement. The final thing I just want to talk about is that, let's go back to Gallipoli and Cyril Hughes, who's now Lieutenant Colonel, with a small staff, seven Australians, two New Zealanders and four British soldiers, who then puts himself on a war footing and goes to war against the Kamala's forces. Uh, so he built a, rebuilt the wharf at Shark. He laid constructed an airfield for the Air Force on the Kilid Bay Plateau, which is just back from uh, Cape Ellis. Uh, 
selected gun positions, laid out military camps, sent one of his boats across to Shanak, or uh, Shanak Lee, I think it is, John, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's right. And he went round in a team model forward and blew up all the old Turkish ammunition dumps that Mustafa Kemal was <coughs> expecting to be able to use when he occupied the area. The last was reportedly blown up in the face of the advancing Turkish cavalry. Um, Mustafa Kemal was reported not to be amused. Um, but I think it's from these sort of things happening on Gallipoli that many Australians think we own Gallipoli. Now, some years ago, there was a great outcry when the first one was going to raise something. How dare they? They can't do that. That's just almost like it, it has the same status just as the citizens of the Southern Shire. I think Bali is another suburb. <laughs> <laughs> um, because that's what we know. We, we've actually taken over. It, it belongs to us. It doesn't, of course, but we think it does. But that's in our national psyche. And it comes from the sort of things that we're doing at this time. Now, as it happened, the Treaty of Boston was uh, signed and we were not called upon to give any uh, in being involved. But it was a... Um, no, it, you can see there that there's a lot of active involvement, often by small groups. But small groups doing what they think Australia needs and up, no, holding the flag up high. It's a very active period of time. We still have re reinforcements, despite the fact that Monash managed to stop the reinforcements going into Europe, we still have reinforcements going and being used in campaign. I'm going to stop there.